Well, to all who have gathered with us today, thank you for coming and for helping us to remember Rory. And I know many of you who are here, but there are a number more here who are beyond my circle. So for those who don't know me, my name is Ben O'Donoghue and Rory was my dear father. Um, I will be leading much of today's memorial service on behalf of the family, um, my sisters, Danielle, Madeline, Jessica, and my mother, Bernie, dad's partner, Carolyn, and her daughters, Juliet, Nicole, and Kirsty, my uncle, Damon, and auntie Bridget, dad's brother and sister, their partners, of course, and children, our cousins, and their families. And, and of course, dad's mother, our dear Sybil, uh, we call her Squibby, uh, she turned 97 only a few weeks ago, and it was wonderful to be together as a family to celebrate that. Again, I would like to begin by giving a, a big thank you from the family, not only to those who are here today, but to the many more, many hundreds more who have expressed messages of sympathy and condolence. We've been truly overwhelmed by the beautiful love and generous support that's been given to us over what has been an incredibly difficult week for us since Dad's passing. Now, as it happens, I am a Christian pastor, and I'm far more accustomed to leading services in my own church building, seeking to serve and support other families in their, in their grieving, and, and most often speaking in the context of a faith community. Today is a completely different gig for me, as, as you can appreciate. Not expecting, I, I was not expecting to be leading a service in memory of my own father, not at this time. But how very appropriate to hold it here in a theatre, those who knew Dad well would understand his love for performing, and he had a particular connection here at the Riverside. He, he performed his last solo show here not, not too long ago. Now, I'm not going to pretend that my father shared all of my own beliefs, and I'm aware that this is a mixed and diverse gathering, as it is in my own family. So we won't be singing hymns today, though there will, of course, be much beautiful music and singing but nevertheless, uh, it is my job, really, to give words of comfort and hope, especially at times like this. So I trust you'll bear with me for sharing some words from my own Christian foundation. Now, while Dad was not what anyone would describe as a religious man, he certainly had a strong spiritual awareness and sensitivity. Uh, he recognised that there were bigger realities than can be explained by just a natural view of the world. And he had a sense of the divine... And while he had lots and lots of questions, as do we all, he often spoke of his belief in God. And I've been fortunate over the years uh, to collaborate musically with my father. I was one third of the Rory O'Donoghue trio for a number of years, or one quarter of the quartet, depending on the lineup. <laughs> and I have particularly fond memories of, of performing with dad, but also of recording with my dad uh, several several times and in several different ways, and we recorded once an album of, of songs that I had composed setting scripture verses from the Bible to music. And one of these verse songs, and the, the sound of Dad's harmony is, is very strong in my memory, was from the Gospel of John. John chapter 5 and verse 24. And these are words that Jesus spoke to the crowds which followed him, and, and through the centuries he continues to speak to us. We're going to just listen. I, th I thought I'd play the, the songs that we recorded together. So this is just a, a snap, um, a, a little grab from, from that song that we did, from John chapter 5, verse 24. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. John chapter 5 and verse 24. He has crossed over from death to life. He has crossed over from death to life. eternal life and will not be condemned John chapter 5 and verse 24 Now in John's gospel Jesus often speaks of himself as the light 
In, in John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, we've openly shared that my father experienced some desperately dark times in his life, and especially in recent times. This darkness was overwhelming for him. Now, and I think that all of us, when we're most honest, recognise that life has its share of darkness, which for many can be all enveloping. And as I sat and spoke with Dad in his darkest times, I would often speak to him of the light of Jesus being stronger than the blackest night. And, and again, you can read in the opening chapter of John's Gospel, verse 5, it says that the, the light of Jesus shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. And just as I held out this certain hope of light to Dad, I hold it out to all of you now. There can be no surer foundation for hope and for peace than that found by those who hear and trust the words of Jesus. The Bible describes God as the father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Now, my family was on holidays just last week. We were in New Zealand when we heard of Dad's passing. I still cannot believe that within three hours we were all on a plane home out of Queenstown. But I'll, I'll forever remember, and it's the worst call that you can imagine taking, a call from my big sister, Danielle. Now, Danielle bore the, the, front, the brunt of the front line with the news. And I was there by the lake of Queenstown, if you know Queenstown. It was very early in the morning, very quiet, and the massive mountains called the Remarkables surround what's really a stunningly beautiful town. And the words of Psalm 121 came to me. This, this was another of the verse songs that I recorded with Dad, and I've always, I've always had them with me. It begins by saying, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and, earth. and then it goes on, we'll listen to the, to the song, it's from, this is from Psalm 121 verses 7 and 8, and the musically astute might pick up the time signature reference with the verse. Psalm 121 verses 7 and 8 Psalm 121 verses 7 and 8 The Lord will keep you from all harm He will watch over your life will keep you from all harm he will watch over your life the lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore both now and forevermore both now and forevermore both now and forevermore Sorry, I let that one run. Dad would never have forgiven me if I faded out before his guitar solo. <laughs> so so the, the words I've shared, it's my hope and prayer that this is Dad's experience now, that he's in the care of the maker of all, heaven and earth. Whew. Okay, let's talk about my dad. Now, of course, most kids think that their dad is amazing. That's why coffee mugs with the world's best dad ever sell so well. But as an adult, I'm able to be more objective. And I, and I realize more and more that with dad, he really was an amazing, an amazing person, a remarkably gifted man. In one of the many messages posted on Facebook over the past week following the news of dad's passing, one astute observer clearly not given to overstatement or hyperbole, described Dad as quite possibly the greatest single talent Australia has produced. <laughs> there is nothing that he couldn't do. And that's really not far from the truth about my dad. He, he reached such incredible heights in so many and varied fields. He was one of those personalities inhabiting that obsessive, perfectionistic space such that when he put his heart to something, he was all in. But I'm already ahead of the story, so let's go back to where it all began. Most of you know him as Rory O'Donoghue, but 
To us, he was first and foremost a real family man. He was dad, he was grandpa, granddad, brother, uncle, often simply just roars. <laughs> he loved his family and his family adored him. Dad was born on the 13th of May, 1949 in Hammersmith, London. He was the first of three children to Terence and Sybil. Damon and Bridget, his brother and sister, followed and they lived their early childhood in the mother country. Both of Dad's parents were opera singers. It's no surprise there. And they had met as part of the Doily Cart Opera Company. And Terry was a chorister and our dear Sybil uh, was the principal subretta. And they did many of the Gilbert and Sullivan classics. Now this heritage was to play out in Dad's life, but not in England because in 1956, Terry got a contract to be the principal tenor with the J.C. Williams organisation here in Australia. And so the family jumped on a ship for the six-week journey from London to Melbourne. And when they arrived, the family, of course, knew absolutely nobody. Now, clearly a classy company, J.C. Williams put them up in possibly the worst hotel in St Kilda. <laughs> Sybil remembers it as a complete dive of a place, so it wasn't the best introduction to beautiful Australia. Uh, Grandpa Terry was regularly touring, of course, with the company, and, and often the family travelled with him, living in the back of an old ambulance, which is kind of quirky. Erdonis are like that sometimes. Squibs, Sybil, she recalls one time when Terry was away on tour, and he was going to finish up the tour in Sydney, and the family planned to move there. And Damon and Bridget had flown up already to Sydney, but Sybil drove the car and their belongings with Dad. And as in all the best road trip stories, the car broke down along the way in the middle of nowhere. And of course, they resorted to hitchhiking, as you do. And they ended up in a country town somewhere, and, and Sybil and Dad sought refuge in the obvious place, a, a presbytery. And as it happens, there were two priests in residence there, and both were off their face drunk. Dad and Sybil managed to get a ride to Sydney and they asked the priest to send their luggage on to their new address in Henley. But not being entirely sober-minded, the priests sent the luggage not to Henley in Sydney, but to Henty in southern New South Wales, hundreds of kilometres away. Uh, it's no surprise, but Dad showed musical gifts from a young age and, and as a 12-year-old, he played the Artful Dodger in the musical Oliver. Growing up, you would often quote that classic line, yeah, what are you staring at? Ain't you never seen a toff before? Dad also played Frederick von Trapp in the 1962 production of The Sound of Music. They bleached his hair white, of course, to make him look more Austrian. And I'm not sure if his hair was ever quite the same again after that. <laughs> Dad also performed in the original production of Jesus Christ Superstar in 1972. And he understudied John English's Judas, John being another tragic loss to us only last year. But his usual role was that of the Apostle Peter. And the words from the musical that Dad sang, they've kind of haunted me a little bit during this week. This was unexpected. What do I do now? Could we start again, please? Hurry up and tell me this is just a dream. <laughs> Could we start again, please? Now, Dad was a natural. He was a natural on several instruments. He could sit on the drums, play the piano, but of course he loved the guitar most of all. In his late teens, he was a lead guitarist in a number of bands, O Couple Day, The Pogs, both classic late 60s rock. They played all originals. And it was during the Candy Stripe Balloon at the Phillips Theatre in September 1969 that Dad met my mum. Um, o Couple Day were performing in the, in the interval, I think, of the, of the performance. And Dad, oh, sorry, Mum was the usherette, and she would stand at the front. Her job was to make sure that the fans didn't get past and, and rush backstage. But clearly, Mum had special access. <laughs> and of course, this is when Dad crossed paths, or he, a few years earlier, but th throughout this time, he crossed paths with, with Graham Bond. And a, a whole new world of opportunities opened up with their friendship and collaboration. And I'm going to leave it to Graham to speak of these times in a moment. But we do want to say, Graham. <laughs> just how much we love you, um, and we've appreciated both your public and private expressions of love for Dad over the years, um, but in this past week especially, so thank you. Mum and Dad married in 1970, and my big sister Danielle was born in 1971. I followed two years later, this is when Auntie Jack was in full swing in the early 70s, then Madeline followed in 1975. And while she was not necessarily planned, we're so thankful that our little sister Jessica completed our family 
when she was born nearly four years later. We've always been such a close family. Uh, Looking back, we didn't have a very steady income stream given the unpredictability of Dad's career as a musician and actor, but we never felt like we missed out on anything. We were part of a community of like-minded friends. Mum and Dad were proponents of alternative education and helped to found the school in which we grew up, Kinmar School. It's still there in the bushland of Terry Hills to the north of Sydney. And the Kinmar, Kinmar community became like an extended family to us, and many of the families remain our close friends to this day. We all have great memories of childhood, lots of laughter, singing, of course. Our school friends were always welcome in the O'Donoghue home, and they came over often because ours was the cool house with the funky dad. (laughs) We were surrounded by music. If dad wasn't tinkling away on the guitar or the piano or tapping away on his practice drum pad or working on his latest music commission, playing it over and over again until it was just perfect, there was always a vinyl playing on the, on the turntable. We grew up listening to the music of James Taylor, Steely Dan, Michael Frank, Sal Jarreau, the Beatles, of course. This was the soundtrack to our lives. Other memories include going on camping trips with our friends and their families and, and regularly playing games as, together. So don't, don't ever take on the O'Donoghue family at charades. We've got you covered. Uh, We'd have the best firework nights in our own backyard. This was back when you could buy, I think it was just for one weekend a year, you could buy a bag of of fireworks from the local news agency and and, and set them off. Now, when Dad was practising or writing music, it was never a good idea to disturb him, but for the most part, Dad was around and and very much active in our lives. He coached my cricket team, he coached Danielle's soccer team. Danielle reminded me that they went through the season as undefeated champions, which just just speaks of, of, of Dad's competitiveness again right there. And to show how he was even in his love for us all, he he coached Madeline's soccer team as well. Now, in 1983, we were fortunate to travel with Dad on a work trip. We were several weeks on the road in our yellow combi van, travelling around Australia. We covered some kilometres. Dad was filming uh, for a travel documentary called Australia on the Breeze, and the premise was that Dad's character was picked up hitchhiking, uh, not by a car or a truck, but by a hot air balloon. And then they travelled wherever the breeze took them around our great country. And it was a magical time away as a family. We have some amazing memories. We visited some wonderful places. And and like all of Dad's music, the material he wrote for Australia on the the breeze is just beautiful. You get a chance to listen to it ever. Now, another perk of having a dad who wrote music was that occasionally he got us um, to sing on various advertising jingles. And not only did this give us good pocket money... It was an amazing experience just to travel with Dad into the studios and watch him at work during recording sessions. Now, if you know Dad well, you know his, his personality is pretty intense. He, he never did anything heart, half-heartedly. As I've already said, Dad was all in or not at all. It was not enough simply to eat a balanced diet. For a time, Dad made us sprinkle dried kelp on all our meals. <laughs> it was not enough simply to be a keen photographer... Dad, for a time, transformed our bathroom, our only bathroom, mind you, for a family of six, four of them girls. He transformed it into a full dark room, black plastic covering the windows, trays of developing chemicals in the bath. He did take some pretty amazing photos, and being Dad, he entered them into magazine competitions, winning prizes, of course. Danielle remembers that it was Dad's passion in this field that encouraged her to do photography for her HSC major work. Now, I've mentioned the kelp phase, but Dad always watched his diet. He was a very healthy man for the most part. And this, of course, inspired us all to be somewhat of a foodie family. But Danielle especially has taken up the macrobiotic organic inspiration into her own cooking career. And these are Danielle's words. One of the most precious things that Dad gave me was the knowledge that I can make a living doing what I love. So when it came to deciding a career path, I only had to think what it was that I loved to do cook healthy food and do yoga. So that's what I did. Danielle also remembers that during a season in her youth when she rode a motorbike, it was after her second accident on the bike that Danny recalls that Dad's protective instinct kicked in and he bought her a car. (laughs) She says it most likely saved her life. In fact, even though the money was tight, Dad never skimped on spending on us for anything. Of course, with musical instruments, we never got the cheap and nasty. For me and Mads and Jess, who played in the school band, Dad was always happy to front up for band tours, even if the tour was to the United States. Mad wrote this reflection. 
Dad always approached everything with diligent practice, a perfectionist not just in his creativity, but in anything that interested him. And I'm thankful for witnessing firsthand what it really means to be successful in life. It's not just natural talent. There is a lot of hard work, research, repetition, and endless hours of practice. He was definitely driven, but there was a gentleness and patience in his approach. And he gifted this tireless ethic to my life and projects too. He supported our numerous bands and multiple music practices week after week. He even mentored me on a couple of journalism and media projects, teaching me how to build a story with the right level of conflict and drama to be interesting to the audience. And later, we would swap fitness stories and workout routines and the best recovery diets. Dad always inspired me to try my very best to take on the responsibility seriously, but to enjoy the doing of it. Mads goes on recalling the countless music-filled memories that always filled our childhood. So listening to uh, Donald Fagan's Nightfly album, which was what we always put on when we were preparing for another fun-filled party at the O'Donoghue House, tr just trying not to eat Dad's signature guacamole before the guests arrived, singing Christmas carols, of course, around the piano, and the way that Dad could just pull out the chord progression for any song that we asked for at any time. Now, for Jessica, being a number of years younger than the rest of us, uh, her child memories are about not only tagging along with the big kids, but following Dad around wherever he went. She remembers that on the weekends when he'd do gardening, she would just sit with him and chat. Or when he would paint a room in the house, she'd be there by his side watching and chatting. She was a little Taekwondo buddy. Yes, Dad did martial arts as well. Tagging along with him to classes and joining in with her junior belt. For Jess, Dad was her idol. And she was his little shadow, just wanting to be with him, whatever he was doing. And to continue Jess's words, and these resonate with me, of course, Jess says... Obviously, for me, later in life, there was the very strong musical connection with Dad. Playing music with Dad was just so special. We rarely had to talk about anything. We were always on the same page and felt our way through the music together, which created an incredibly strong and special bond. I am so blessed to have been able to work so closely with Dad in music. He was an absolute master, and the like, the whole of my life. Growing up, I couldn't help but follow in his footsteps to make music my life as he had done. Now Dad's inbuilt competitiveness and drive meant that when Dad took up running again, it quickly morphed into triathlon and then ramping up to Ironman. Now David from the Warringah Triathlon Club will be sharing about this amazing side of Dad's later life. But we've all been blown away by Dad's achievements. I cannot begin to relate to the levels of fitness my dad achieved. But more than anything, it was Dad's musicality that touched so many. He was incredibly generous with his gift. He was always happy to encourage others. We all went to the Forest High School, which in those years especially was a very strong school for music. And Dad was, of course, significantly involved in encouraging us and even sitting in occasionally with our school stage band in the days when we played in the Entertainment Centre for Sydney King's basketball home games. He really was an amazing teacher. I know of those who went to Dad even just for a couple of lessons and they still remember what he showed them because he was able to open up musical pathways and different ideas that most teachers are not even aware of. Now, sharing his vast musical knowledge and encouraging others was a significant part of Dad's life. And over the last couple of decades, he has tutored hundreds and hundreds of young musicians, both privately and at various schools around Sydney, Queenwood, Skeggs Redlands, Masada College in St Ives, and for a number of years at Abbotsley. And Royner is going to share of this in, 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 in a little while also. Looking back, Dad clearly had his struggles through those years at different times, and it really is a credit to our amazing mum. She shouldered much of the family burden of Dad's difficulties and shielded us from it for the most part. Now, Dad really managed amazingly well, and for, really for the last 16 years or so, he's been strong and incredibly fit, fit wonderfully active. He, he met the beautiful Carolyn Bennett. Cara's going to share so, shortly too but it has just been so special for us to see Dad so happy over these last several years. Carolyn and her beautiful family were adored by Dad and we're so thankful that our families have been brought together in, this, in these years. And while Dad's been mostly well for so long, he's really been struggling this last year especially. And we have particularly wanted to be open about Dad's struggles with mental illness in, in recent months, his condition manifested as a deep, deep and dark depression. 
And of course, Dad has always been surrounded by so much light and love, but it's the tragedy of his condition that he was recently unable to receive it or feel it. And we're so devastated by this. And we really want to do all that we can to help remove the stigma that so often surrounds the issue of mental health in our society. We know that it is so hard for so many families who are touched by this illness. And that's what it is. It's, a, it's an awful sickness which ultimately took Dad from us. Now, on the flight home from New Zealand just last week, these were the very first reflections that I wrote. How devastating that you can have so much to give and yet feel so desperately empty. That you can be surrounded by so much love and yet feel so very alone. To have so much reason to live and yet, so, yet feel so deeply helpless and hopeless. It's been a tough week for us, a sad, sad time for us as a family. There has been laughter in the midst of the t many tears as we've all remembered the amazingly full life that Dad lived. And this really is our hope for today, that it will be a true celebration of a remarkable life. We love you so much, Dad. And no words cannot describe how deeply you're going to be missed. Your generous spirit and your compelling legacy will always remain very alive within us all. What we're going to try and do now is I'm going to invite Bridget, Dad's sister, to come up and she's going to sing a song for us. Um, and those who are accompanying as well can come up too. We're going to sing a couple of James Taylor songs. Dad loved James Taylor. We all love James Taylor. We were so fortunate to go with Dad um, earlier in the year to his concert when he toured Australia, which was just such a special time. Dad and I just sat next to each other and we were just blown away. We just kept looking at each other saying, this is amazing. And so thankful that we were able to share that time together. Thank you, Ben. It was beautiful. Um, just before I start my song, I just want to uh, pay tribute to Ross. Um, he was my big brother. And he was my hero. And uh, he taught me how to sing the blues, <laughs> which I'm eternally grateful for. Um, like Jess, he was my absolute idol um, and brought music into my life. Of course, my parents too. But uh, I used to follow him around all the studios and hang out with all his really cool friends and uh, get really jealous of all his girlfriends because he was mine. And. Uh, and eventually uh, found my way into the uh, industry myself and uh, if it weren't for Raw, I would never have found my way. So thanks, Raw. And I'm going to sing a James Taylor song for him because he loved James so much. So here we go. Ooh, when you're down and troubled and you need some loving care And nothing, nothing is going right Call my name and think of me Soon I will be there To brighten up even your darkest night You just call out my name And you know wherever I am I'll come running To see you again Winter, spring, summer or fall All you got to do is call When the sky above you should turn dark full of clouds, that old north wind, it 
begins to blow Keep your head together going to happen now is we're going to have a number of tributes. I'm going to sit down for a bit <laughs> and so I'm going to ask that um, for, for, for those who are giving tributes if you could just follow each other in the order of, of the program. Um, I won't get up in, in between and announce each one. And then following the, the tributes we're going to go straight into a, a presentation that, that's, um, that's been lovingly prepared uh, by Matt um, and, and, his, and his team. Um, and so yeah, this, this, this is going to be Tough time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I wish we could have been here. Numbness, disbelief, denial and devastation. These are the emotions I've been feeling since I heard that Roy had passed away. I'm also angry, not at him, but at the hospital, because I feel they were negligent in their duty of care. And then there's the overwhelming sadness to think how desperate Rory was, and that our love was not enough to save him. But today is not about me, it's about Rory, who we all loved and adored. I first saw Rory 16 years ago. He was singing with Ben, at our local coffee shop in Glenrose Shopping Centre. My squash friends and I were weekly regulars at this cafe after our Saturday morning game. I didn't know anything about Rory or his past. Someone told me he played the part of Thin Arthur on the Auntie Jack show. But that show was in the early 70s and I'd been forbidden to watch it because they said the terrible word bloody. <laughs> Anyway, one day Rory joined us for lunch, and I guess the rest is history. When my youngest daughter met him, she was only five, 
and she pulled me aside and she whispered in my ear, Mummy, he hasn't got any hair. (laughs) I think she thought I hadn't noticed. (laughs) Rory was my soulmate. He filled my and my daughter's lives with sunshine, love and laughter. He gave so much of himself to others and his love and generosity knew no bounds. We miss him so much already, what we wouldn't do to turn back the clock and just spend one more day with him. But life is not about the end, it's about the journey. And Rory started his journey 68 and a half years ago with his incredibly amazing mother, Sybil, and his father, Terry. And we were very blessed to finish the last 16 with him. And I wish our journey had gone on longer. So whenever I walk along DUI Beach, I think of Rory running to and fro and to and fro and I'd pass him and he'd pass and because he just never knew really when to stop and it was just lovely. So Rory will never be forgotten and he'll live on in my heart and your heart and everyone's hearts forever. So till we meet again, my love. I loved Rory, God. We were a team for 51 years. I think he liked me, um, (laughs) even though I was a really shit-ass guitar player. He forgave me. Um, We wrote so many songs together, and today I I don't know whether I'll get through with it, but... But it was very interesting. Doug Mulray and I went to see Rory uh, only days before we lost him. And, um, and I was talking to Rory about his favourite songs. And one of the songs that, that he and I wrote, and was my favourite as well, I don't know whether I'll get through it, but I'm going to try, it was uh, unaccompanied, it, um, it was from Fatty Finn. We wrote a lot of songs about friendship, Neil and Errol, Little Men on the Park Bench. Um, I don't know if I can even remember that. Just we sat a birthday sketch, which Rory and I sang, but we're good friends, Errol and Neil, yes we are. We sit in the park and sing songs until dark, but we're never alone. My best friends, Errol and Neil. Oh, yep. But the song from Fatty Finn, was very appropriate. It was everybody's talking about the way we hang around together, you and I. How could anybody try to understand me without you and you without I? Nobody knows the reason why. Gee, but we're good mates, you and I. You probably know now why Rory was the singer and I was the. <coughs> was the was the other one in the partnership. <laughs> As I said, we were partners for 51 years. It was amazing. We did so many we were business partners, we were comedy partners, we were musical partners. And I met Rory, gosh, 1966. He was just in the band. And something magic happened. There was a chemistry between the two of us. We just became very good friends, very close, very... We sort of understood, and there was something I think that I really understood about Rory. I've heard the family talk about him, his brother and sister saying that he was an adventurer, he took risks, he, took, he, he, he was, lived dangerously, and he took them on terrible excursions that nearly destroyed them. Um, to come on the journey we were going to go on, uh, you needed to be a risk taker, because it's a pretty dangerous game, the one we went into. And he was fine. He never once complained. He just went with everything. He just, he just went along and 
He did all the, all the stuff you'd ever want. The, the thing we had in common was we had a love affair for music and, and comedy. This place, as Ben said, has great memories for both of us, for Rory and myself. Um, it's very dear to us. I just feel so empty, you know. It just, I feel like Neil and Errol's alone on that park without that other person there. <laughs> and it can never be again. Um, I'd like to thank Robert Love and Sean Clark for coming to our assistance and offering the theatre. It was very generous of you, and thank you very much. That was a lovely thing to do. Rory and I performed our one-man shows here, as Ben said. We did a lot of uh, things for, for the theatre. Um, and if you just put it up, we could just go. We did a, a national tour of the Auntie Jack show and tell. Um, we toured Australia, just the two of us, with Sean and, and the gang. And I just found one of the programs here, and I was looking through Auntie Jack Chantel. And <clears throat> we were asked to write um, a letter on behalf of the characters we played, obviously Auntie Jack, the Queen of Wollongong, and Rory was then Arthur, the Prince of Port Kembla. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just read the Auntie Jack one to, to set up Rory's letter. A royal pronouncement to all my loyal subjects. Firstly, I'd like to apologise for my disappearance for the past 30 years, but I've had a terrible headache. <laughs> my psychiatrist, Igor, says it's a result of the guilt I feel for all my illegal arms dealings. <laughs> but then, that was then. Today, this royal tour aims to salvage the once great kingdom of Wollongong and help all the little people on Struggle Street the horrible little ones who struggle and wriggle constantly, probably because they've got worms. So, kiddies, remember, always wash your hands, because if you don't, I'll rip the... Sorry, there I go again. I'm sorry, I apologise. <laughs> Regards from your loving highness, Auntie Jack. Rory's reply to that was from the desk of the Prince of Port Kembla, and he wrote this. He said, Kind people of the gong, I'm writing this note under great duress. I'm not being disloyal, but 30 years ago, Auntie Jack promised me she'd retire and I could ascend the throne as King Arthur III. But since the big headache, she seems to have forgotten. What concerns me most is her psychiatrist, Igor, our postman, informed me that she's considering cloning herself. Maybe it's time for me to leave Wollongong. Please don't tell her I said that. Yours truly, Thin Arthur, the Prince of Port Kembla. Now... Anyone who worked with Rory could attest that he was mighty fast on his feet, not just as a runner, he was, he was fast on his feet as a runner, but he was fast on his feet. He was a, he was a funny guy, as, as, uh, improvising. Nude radio is a classic example. There we were doing nude radio when Double J first started. And it was a real test. I mean, Gary McDonald, the three of us, Gary McDonald, Rory and myself did this show three hours live on a Sunday afternoon and no script, nothing at all. But Rory's imagination was incredible. Uh, he could improvise. I think to him, I, I suppose he could equate it a bit like, um, like a jazz solo. You know, it had a start and it had a finish and you just winged it in the middle. And he took off and he used to do the most amazing things. He had some great characters. For those who remember Nude Radio, he had the wicked, wicked Miss McKinley, dreadful North Country doctor, Dr Duncan Chambers, and one that he based on, a, Gary McDonald, remember, based on a, a roadie. We used to have a roadie that uh, travelled with us and his name was... Uh, uh, yeah, I don't remember his name, yes, sir. Um, I, um, Whatever his name was. Anyway, Rory based this character on him called Father Wayne the Groin Minio. And uh, it was a fantastic character. That, that uh, Before that, if we go back from th this one, you can start yeah, rolling them through. In 75, Gary, uh, Rory and I went on the Auntie Jack Gong and Bloody Concert Tour. We did 28 concerts in 31 days. And we flew all over Australia. But most of the time, we travelled around by bus. And 
it was pretty boring. We'd do long, long journeys in the bus. And I can remember there were two things they did down the back of the bus. They played cards or they did arm wrestling. Now, Rory won a fortune at cards because he could count cards. He was good. And I, we set him up once, and when we got to the Hobart Casino, we all pulled our money together, and we gave it to Rory to take to the casino, and he lost the bloody lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he could clean us all up on the bus, but he didn't do too well in the casino. They had it rigged. But arm wrestling was the thing. This was a real insight into Rory O'Donoghue. He, Thin Arthur, he was then, re- he didn't have, have a six-pack, he was just a re- this skinny guy, and we had gorillas as our roadies. They were gorillas, and we had Winternucky Winyard, God bless him, he was our sound engineer, a big Maori, and he was a monster of a guy. And Rory used to, eat, used to arm wrestle all the time. And the truth is, he never lost. He, he didn't always win, but he never lost, because he'd just hold them, and you'd see them sweating, and Rory would just hold them. So he had this sort of inner strength. He just wouldn't let go. He just would look them in the eye and he'd just hop this little skinny guy holding these people. And he just and that's what I think, you know, he had mental strength and he had this physical strength. And that's what came to light when he when he, he went on to become a, a fantastic athlete. The, the only funny story well, not the only, there's plenty of stories. The funny story I remember we, we used to play characters called the Farrelly brothers. Uh, Rory, Gary and I standing on stage and there was one sketch in particular where the Farrelly brothers were doing a recitative device and um, Rory used to, to make it look like we had uh, grass on stage, we bought this stuff called Colt's Foot, Colt's Foot and it was from a, a health shop and it, uh, when lit it smelt like dope and, uh, and it looked like dope. So in this thing, we're, we're, he's, he's rolling this joint on stage and uh, I start off going, I'd like to do a set of advice by Australia's great um, uh, poet, Banjo Wahanui Patapuni. And we did, we did, everyone started off and we do the cult from Snowy Aloha. Um, so what... What happened the next day, we all got up and went off, and somebody had obviously reported us because there was a police block on the, on the road and about six police came into the, the bus and they went through it and they busted us for about two pounds of colt's foot. Um, <laughs> apparently there's no respiratory problems in uh, <coughs> that area anymore. Now, I was just, lastly, I was going to talk about... Uh, yeah, it, TV's a dangerous game. Uh, I remember shooting the... The titles for Auntie Jack in Bombo Quarry down near uh, Wollongong, past Wollongong. And uh, Rory and I were doing all that. Gary was on a, some stupid bike, I can remember. Uh, Rory and I were on a 1,200cc Harley Davidson. I'm driving it. I didn't even have a car license, <laughs> let alone a bike license. So. Morris Murphy set it all up and there were four cameras because this was the big shot. You know, this was Rory and I ripping that big shot up over the hills, screaming down towards camera. So he had four cameras. He had one up on the mountain, one on the cliff, one on the bike, one roving camera. So Murphy's there and he'd go, roll camera one, camera two, camera two, camera three, camera four, all ready. They're all ready and action. And I stood up on the bike and I went, Morris, which one did you say was the break again? <laughs> Rory went white. He just went white. But the fabulous thing was he didn't get out of the car. He didn't. He stayed in that side car and he went ahead and he did it. And I think uh, he got... Well, the fabulous thing was he, he became overconfident. Once I got a hang of it, we started rolling around Bombo Quarry and Rory got more and more confident saying, tell you about my auntie Jack, auntie, auntie. And he's sitting up on the back of the, the side car and he was standing up in the side car and the next thing I looked over my shoulder, there was no Rory. <laughs> he was flat on his ass about 50 metres back. So he was fearless. As I said, he, he just did crazy things. Um, I think I'm nearly ready to uh, run a, a little bit of footage. This is the last performance that uh, Rory and I did together, and it was on the 24th of November this year, and it was Glebe Books. And um, I just need to set it up a little bit because whoever filmed this clipped the top and tail off it, but um, Rory and I always had a, a standby finale, depending on what happened in anything we did. Um, uh, and in this case, uh, it was a lovely audience, and 
we hadn't done this routine for 10 years. This is, and, and Rory wasn't very well at the time because he was ready to do it and then he wasn't and then he was and then, and then he said, I, I'll do it, I will do it. And uh, we used to say, look, to show our gratitude for being such a wonderful audience, we'd like to sing for you every song ever written. And Rory would come in and go, except for Hey Jude, because hey, you know, the na 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 na's go on forever and ever and ever. And blah, Paul McCartney, you know, and it'd be so boring. So he'd say, sit back and relax because for the next 24 hours, we're all yours. And he'd start off, he'd start it with all of me. Why not take all of me? Now, if you just cut in and just drop the lights, you can see it. Why not take all of me? And my shadow walking down the avenue made me so very happy. Birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Michel Mardel. Sans les mots qui vont très bien ensemble, très bien ensemble. We're over the rainbow, <laughs> way up high. Got a lovely bunch of coconuts. <laughs> See them all standing in a row. Row, row your boat gently down the stream. <laughs> merrily, 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 life is but to dream. The impossible dream <laughs> to fight the unbeatable foe. A deer, a female deer, me, <laughs> a drop of golden sun. Me. Yesterday my life was filled with rain Rocks keep falling on my head and head Just like a guy feeding too big for his bed Bed, Leroy Brown Bed is my name the whole damn time Bed and old King Cole was his merry old soul was his merry old soul was he Hey, hey, he called for a light in the middle of the night He called for his fill of three coins in a fountain Each one bringing happy Talky, 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 happy talk. Happy July, cool, do you want to dance and hold my hand? Hey. Tell me, baby, that I'm your man, oh baby. Do you want to dance in the old fashioned way? Now you're in New Orleans. There's a place for us. A time, time, time is on my side. Yes, it is. Anybody here seen Kelly? Kelly. K E double L. Why, why, why? Delilah, we're not sorry. sorry. My, my, my. Mezzy, dots and dozy, dots and little lambsy, dimey. Kelly, dimey, too. Wouldn't you sing it? Na, 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 He was so wonderful. I remember Doug Mulroy watched that and he said, mate, you and Rory just made that something so complicated <laughs> look so bloody easy. He was a genius. He was really brilliant. Thank you and thank Rory O'Donnell. <laughs> this is Uh, so, good day. Um, so, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, what uh, what we knew of Rory at the uh, Warringah Triathlon Club. Um, so, the background is, and, and long before my time, Rory started triathlon in in 2003, and he joined the Warringah Triathlon Club in in 2004. Um, he he loved racing, um, all distances, and uh, you know, pretty quickly he was up to racing. Ironman distance um, triathlons. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's a, a 3.8 kilometer swim, 180 kilometers on a bike, and then run a 42K uh, ma full marathon at the end of that. Um, he did his first um, Ironman in 2008 at Port Macquarie, and he pretty quickly did two or three others straight afterwards, and he was pretty much basing his season around running you know, at least a, a full Ironman every year, and he carried on doing that, and he was in Melbourne in 2012, and we know he went to Cairns Ironman in, in, 
in 2014, where he actually came fifth in his, in his age group. He was back in Cairns in 2015. He came second in his age group. Um, also in 2015, he represented Australia in the ITU um, duathlon world championships um, down in Adelaide. Um, he ended up coming seventh in his age group there, seventh in the world. Um, in 2016, he actually won his age group at the um, half Ironman race out at uh, Western Sydney, out at, out at Penrith. Um, he particularly enjoyed all different races. He also competed in our club races up at North Head, which are a very informal um, type of race. I know he particularly enjoyed the Nepean Triathlon out at Penrith, and he also competed in, in duathlons, and I think really pertinent just over here in, in, in Parramatta Park. Um, and he also competed in park runs, 5K park runs on a Saturday morning down at, at, at Curl Curl. Um, really, that's just to give you an understanding of the, the athlete that Rory was. Um, you don't do those, those type of races and so many races unless you love what you're doing. Um, but also, you need to be, you know, you need to have some degree of... Um, you know, physical fitness and some, you know, capability and athleticism to start with, but you also need an enormous amount of dedication. And actually just sitting here today, I mean, it's just resonant that that's something that obviously was in lots of different parts of his, his life, and he definitely demonstrated it within, within his triathlon career. Um, he was obviously talented and dedicated. Um, however, for... For us within the club, um, he was much more than that. He was, <clears throat> he was a volunteer. He actually, he came and did his photography for the club um, as well. Um, and also, he was just so friendly and helpful to so many other people. Um, something that's really you know, been borne out in the last week or so as well with um, how people have been demonstrating their feelings for him. Um, I only found out that this week, actually, I found out this week that it was Rory who came up with our, our motto, Dare to Try, which is plastered on the back of our, uh, our cycling shorts. Um, of course he did. <laughs> um, you know, Rory treated people with so much respect and so friendly. He was always a helping hand. He'd been there and done that in his races, and he was there to help other people. Um, and not just our club, you know, in this week, um, you know, there have been messages from you know, Jarvis Bay Triathlon Club, um, Bendigo Triathlon Club, The Hills, who probably one of our biggest rival triathlon clubs. But you know, to Rory, that was nothing. He was out there. He was at all these different races. He was making friends with lots of different people, regardless where they were from. Um, I think that's what people here probably recognize um, in him. Um, more than that, even, you know, Rory combined his talents right, in writing a couple of songs for our triathlon club. Um, songs that he wrote a song about Iron Mike Smith. Mike Smith is here um, today, The Ballad of Iron Mike. Um, he actually released it on an album. I can't believe he put that on an album. Um, but it was... Rory was in his element when we went away once a year for the New South Wales Club Championships, where we used to do our race, normally do quite well, and then we'd have a dinner. And at the end of the dinner, Rory would get up with his guitar and sing the Warringah Triathlon Club song, which he wrote um, himself. <laughs> it was the absolute highlight for the season. Everybody joining in, telling everybody how we're going to beat the Brats and beat the Hills and... Um, he was absolutely in his element then, and for me, that's a memory that I will be forever keeping, um, and I think a lot of people in our club will think of Rory in that moment where he was just combining those things that he, he loved um, so much. Um, you know, I'm up here today representing the Triathlon Club, and I think I'll just read a couple of um, comments that appeared on our Facebook page um, during the week. Um, so sad. Great bloke. Always ready with a cheerful wave and a chat. I'll miss our on-course age group friendly competition, your wonderful musical talent and the great mate that you were to so many. 
such a talent and a genuine good guy. Never saw him without a smile and certainly matched the smile he gave to others. Only met Rory a few times. He grew to be a legend to me in no time. Such a kind soul will always remember his great spirit and musical talent. And Rory touched the hearts of such a wide community and circle of people in sport, music and arts. We'll miss you so much. I think the, the sentiment was so consistent. He was, um, he was a talent. He was such a nice guy. Um, and he was so caring for for everybody else. It's such a, uh, a great loss. Um, yeah, Rory, you were you know, the epitome of the um, athletic, um, friendly, supportive and fun philosophy of our triathlon club. And he was such a um, you know, vital component of our club that we're going to miss him um, enormously. But um, we're very grateful for, to have known him, um, grateful that he was in our club and we were very, very proud of him. So, thank you. When I appointed Rory O'Donoghue as music tutor to Abbotsley over 15 years ago, I knew he was an extraordinarily talented musician. What I could never have known was the impact he would have on so many young lives as he nurtured their talent. Always giving so freely of his time, the girls knew they had someone special to teach them and to accompany them. Whether accompanying a student on the Opera House stage for encore or Abbotsley's 130th birthday concert, or accompanying students, students for the HSC examinations or soirees, playing with his beloved guitar ensemble, sitting in the band for the school musical, or quietly performing a duet in Studio Nine. Rory's commitment and musicality never wavered. The moment he picked up his guitar, he was in performance mode. He had the ability to transform the simplest melodic line into something very special. An outstanding arranger and composer, students and staff alike would bring recordings and music to Rory, and with a wry smile he would say, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Nothing appeared to be too much trouble for Rory, and he knew instinctively how to arrange music that would help a young performer shine. Rory's gentle and caring nature ensured that the girls felt totally supported in their musical pursuits. Everyone wanted to be taught by Mr O'Donoghue. I could recount numerous stories from past and present students describing how Mr O'Donoghue helped them to be the musicians they are today. I would like to share the thoughts of two such students with you. Though I left Abbotsley at the end of 2010, Rory and I have remained good friends until his passing. I have looked up to him as if he were the godfather that I never had. I had stopped performing and was suffering from debilitating performance anxiety, but in the last two years had been speaking to Rory about picking it up again, and he'd offered to help in any way he could. Rory said to me, it's interesting what life's rich journey throws at us. Of course, music and creativity are a huge part of our lives and I can imagine how you are feeling. It's a tricky business, the entertainment scene, as there are never any guarantees. We do it for the love of it and because we simply need to do it. It is who we are. Do get in touch when you return to Australia, and I, of course, will be there for you. Very best wishes, Rory. And a second student also said, My experience at Abbotsley would have been nowhere near as amazing without having the honour of knowing and working alongside Mr O'Donoghue. He was not only a music teacher, but also a friend and mentor. With his infectious smile, he would always brighten my day. 
I would not be the musician I am today without Mr. O'Donoghue's inspiration and support. I know every time I pick up my guitar, he is in my thoughts, and I'll always be strumming alongside him. I have no doubt there will be countless Abbasley students who will remember Mr. O'Donoghue smiling and strumming his guitar beside him, beside them. Rory's influence was felt equally amongst the staff. I remember some staff feeling a little in awe of Rory when he first arrived. However, the remarkable thing about Rory was how lightly he carried his fame. It was all about the music, and it soon became apparent that his gift was the music, and he just kept on giving. Rory's performances at our staff on stage concerts were legendary. When I would ask the staff for volunteers to perform, Rory would be always the first to pop into my office and say, put me down. He would always be willing to spend the time to work with others to ensure the best possible musical outcome. In the early days, Rory would often perform with his son Ben on bass. He also loved playing with his mates, percussionist Ron Lemke and jazz pianist Ray Forster. The staff on stage concert was not complete without a Rory set. Such was Rory's versatility as a performer that he found himself performing not only for the music department, but for the wider school community. He entertained parents, staff and students. Everyone knew and loved Mr O'Donoghue. His passion and humour connected with so many. He could perform in almost any genre and he transitioned from guitar, drums and vocals with ease. His improvisations were executed with technical precision. But more importantly, Rory's playing always came from the heart. The staff and students at Abbotsley were so fortunate to have known Rory, a wonderful teacher and mentor a caring colleague, and an outstanding musician. He was truly a gentle man and a creative soul, and he brought inspiration to so many through his music. We have been privileged to share part of his unique life, and for that we say thank you. Rest in peace, Rory, and may the wings of song light your path evermore. Jack, we know you'll be back Though you're ten feet tall You don't scare us at all You're big, bold and tough But you're not so rough There's a scream as you plummet away You know, it'd be great to be a schoolboy again, eh, Stan? So good. It's got to be the best days of your life. Yes, they were such good times Now they're so far away Bring them back and let's relive our schoolboy Good old schoolboy days They were good old schoolboy
Sonny Jack, yeah. and nothing but pitch black. Oh, oh what you feeding then? Ants. ants. I'm feeding the ants. But you can't feed ants great peanuts like that. <laughs> Why can't you? Well, I mean, you've got to shell them, obviously, haven't you? <laughs> no, you don't. They love a challenge. Jack, you've gone coloured. Why, no, Arthur? We don't need a big joke. <laughs> a big joke? <laughs> no joke being a lime flavoured jelly. Till the start time Drive the circuit in my mind Do you do a fever? You're gonna win it on the line A funny kind of freedom Four wheels in the cab I'm just living for the moment But the crowd isn't here Hear the crowd Hear the crowd Feel the pulse of the people People Engine whining now All I want is a room somewhere Far away from the cold night air With one enormous chair Oh, wouldn't it be lovely Lots of chocolate for me to eat Lots of coal making love of eat warm face warm hands warm feet oh wouldn't it be lovely oh so lovely sitting up sublimely 
outwardly still I would never stop till spring crept over my windowsill someone's head resting on my knee warm and tender as she can be who takes good care of me oh would and it be lovely So lovely sitting up sublum and lully still I would never stop till spring crept over the windowsill someone's head resting on my knee warm and tender as she can be who take good care of me oh wouldn't it be lovely 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 I've literally stepped into my dad's shoes. These are his. Um, I wouldn't use the same adjective to describe my guitar playing as Graham did, but I'm just a fraction of the guitarist that my father was, so um, bear with me as we do this. I'm not going to say anything because I won't be able to sing, but I hope I can sing this for you, Sean.
Just take your arms Just take your arms Take your own sweet time I can hold on Just take your own sweet Thanks, I can talk a bit now, but <laughs> that song, and Dad and I used to always sing that together. That was our party piece. And um, it's just been such a gift being able to connect with Dad on that level. Dad wasn't always, it wasn't always easy for Dad to kind of connect with us verbally as a family and tell us how he felt, but that was my way of connecting with Dad through music. And... Uh, it was so special not only to be able to share music with the most talented muso I know, but also to connect with such a special human and my very own dad. So, thanks. I'm going to sing Shower the People, another great James Taylor song that Dad loved. And we thought it was just a beautiful sentiment. And we'd love you to all join in with us at the end, please. <laughs> Oh, Jams, we were going to do that too. He's freaking out.
brings this part of the day to an end. Um, of course, it will continue and we, we invite people to, to remain and in the foyer there will be refreshments there. There will be an opportunity um, for you to, to, to write um, in, in a memorial book that we have there. So please take the time if you have something particular um, that, you, that you want to share there. That, 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 would be, that would be a wonderful thing for us. Once again, Graham mentioned them, but we want to um, thank so much um, Robert and Sean and Mariana and Mike and Tristan and the staff here at Riverside um, for their amazing generosity in, in having us here today. <laughs> the way we're going to finish is we're going to play um, just, just the audio um, of Farewell Auntie Jack. And, you can do uh, remember, Dad, how you, how you want as this plays. You can sing along if you like, or you can sit and reflect, close your eyes, um, look at your memories, um, and then once, once that track's finished, we'll, we'll make our way out into the foyer. So thank you once again. Jack, we know you'll be back Though you're ten feet tall You don't scare us at all You're big, bold and tough But you're not so rough There's a scream as you plummet away Hello, me little lovelies So remember, you better listen to this song real close I'll tell you what, if you don't, I'm gonna jump through your speakers and rip your bloody arms off. And I will too. Don't forget it. Especially you, stupid. She rides a black bike. I do. And drives through the night. Right. She's big, round and fat, but don't dare tell her that. Because she turns so mean Her glove starts to green And she screams as she plummets Goodbye, me little lovelies Oh, we really, really love you And we think the world about you Won't you please come back to our house Please come back, dear Auntie Jack Now you Jack, please don't forget me Just remember